Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpe, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpy, and today we're going to be talking about a law in Canada about medical assistance in dying. Uh, or also called MAID. And I invite you to go to the Government of Canada's website for more information. If you go to canada.ca, go through justice, and you can uh, read as much about this law as you wish. And here to talk about it today, uh, we have a, a doctor of psychiatry psychiatry in uh, Dr. Uh, Nick Tito. Nick, uh, welcome to the Common Bridge. Awesome. Thank you. Glad to have you. Uh, Nick, our audience likes to know a little bit about our guests. So tell us a little bit, what are your, some of your early days and your academic preparation and what you're up to today? Sure. Um, so grew up in Southern California. It's where I'm actually physically located today, uh, moonlighting a clinic down the street. Um, normal upbringing and decided I wanted to go to medical school after a little bit of time with the Army. Um, kind of on a whim, was able to get accepted. Um, I went to a school in Mississippi, um, and then my wife got a pretty big promotion, um, and so I was able to transfer to Toro, which is where I finished at over in New York, uh, New York City. I did a lot of my rotations in uh, New Jersey. Um, I went to med school to be a surgeon, and I ended out I ended up becoming a psychiatrist. Um, but that's a, that's a topic for a whole nother podcast. Um, but I've loved psychiatry. It's a great field. Um, I think especially in the post COVID era, I think, uh, we're getting a lot of attention in the, in the media. Um, and so it's nice that the other medical specialties are being a little nicer to us lately. Um, they, they see our importance. And so, uh, that's a little bit about me. I was able to, I went to residency then and, uh, uh now in North Carolina and, Having fun. Well, great. Well, we did have Dr. Victor Hong on, who is also a psychiatrist at the Michigan Medicine. Uh, he runs the Psychiatric Emergency Services. Uh, Judge Milton Mack talking about the mental health crisis and, you know, kind of bringing uh, mental health treatment uh, on a par with medical treatment. Um, and, you know, what prompted the this podcast was uh, some discussions you and I were having online. We don't know each other. Uh, but about this new law in Cal in Canada, and actually it's not a new law. It, the law was originally passed in 2016, uh, began implementation in 2017 um, to set forth guidelines about who's eligible for uh, medically assisted uh, death. And essentially from my lay reading of it, that um, if you pass certain criteria, uh, you can be given a deliberate overdose of drugs and take yourself out or get someone to help take you out. Um, but the change that's going online in just two months, in March of this year, is that you don't need a medical condition, J just having a psychiatric condition and wanting to end your life can get you approved. Am I reading that correctly? So that is correct. Um, the one caveat is that it seems that in late December, uh, just so just a couple of days ago, uh, a Canadian court is contemplating putting it on hold. Um, and it seems that there is public opinion in Canada to put the psychiatric conclusion on hold. Um, but I, I'm not quite sure what the status is of that as of now. Yeah, and I and I went digging for that and went right to the uh, government of Canada website. I've got a lot of that information in front of me today. Um, they're not. Um, advocating it at this point as far as making any kind of a delay. Um, but this is about changes to the criminal code. And the the criminal code, um, obviously, we cannot have a homicide. Uh, but they're saying that if you want to get someone to help you, 
and you can be a physician. It can be a nurse practitioner. Uh, it can be a pharmacist or pharmacy tech. It can be a family member or someone else that asks or a healthcare provider. Um, it doesn't seem like it limits who might be the support person in carrying out a medically assisted death. Am I reading that correct? So that is correct. And that's in the Swiss tradition. So the, the, the Swiss law, as it's been since I believe 1945, uh, 1940s for sure, uh, the way that the Swiss law is written out is as long as you have capacity, anybody can help administer um, these life ending drugs to you so long as they have no uh, benefit from doing so. And so that's why in, in Swiss, there's a little, it's not that big, but there is a, you could say, um, a tourism of a euthanasia tourism that occurs in Switzerland, where um, a lot, it's mostly people from the UK will travel to Switzerland and utilize um, commercial businesses that operate this, um, this function. And now I don't believe that they take profit from it. They're nonprofits. So I guess suppose business is the wrong word. Um, but they do. That is kind of the model that the Canadian law is is mimicking in, in the Swiss model. Yeah, and what the Canadian law was up until this time was that to be eligible, there had to be a grievous and irremediable medical condition, um, the, the, and as you said, there had to be a voluntary request and informed uh, consent, and that the serious illness, disease, or disability which at the time excluded uh, mental illness, had to be in an advanced state of decline that could not be reversed, and that a person was suffering unbearable pain that could not be um, relieved. Now, under the current law, um, if your only condition was a medical or mental illness, um, you're not eligible until um, a month, uh, in March, in just two short months. Why do you think they made this change? I mean, you're someone that's dealing with psychiatric issues all the time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm glad that the psychiatric issue is, is kind of coming under the umbrella of medical problems. So that's, uh, I mean, just the kind of paradigm of seeing it that way is a good thing. Um, the, the, the fact with psychiatry is that it's a, it's a field that touches some of the most vulnerable patients um, in a nation. And so oftentimes a lot of our patients are homeless. Um, unfortunately they suffer from d drug addiction. Um, and these are the patients that are usually in, in, in contact with adult inpatient, inpatient psychiatric facilities, state psychiatric facilities, and then prisoners as well in the forensic, uh, psychiatric facilities. And so we, we touch a lot of the patients that there's really no good place to put them because, they have a lot, they have mental conditions that preclude them from really functioning in society um, in a way that's behaviorally appropriate. Um, now, in that, there's a lot of suffering. Um, I mean, you could take any patient's story, um, patients that, you know, d and depending on where you fall in the line of moral culpability, any patient's story is, is usually pretty tragic on an inpatient psychiatry unit. Um, and so, a lot of these patients, as they go through their conditions, they have capacity to understand what's wrong with them. They, they know that life is difficult and they're, they wish to take, make the autonomous choice to end their life um, because they feel that where they're at, the cards they were dealt, and the options of changing the, the suffering that's occurring in their life just are, are not ideal to be able to do that. And so they don't really see a way out. Um, and so good intentioned people have seen the suffering that occurs on our wards and they've sided with the patient's autonomous request in terms of advocacy. Um, and it comes from a good place. It really does. It, it's, it's, I have not yet seen a single person seeing this as some type of solution to get rid of people that are depressed or are having a hard, t hard time in life. It's really trying to accommodate an autonomous request from a person who is suffering. Um, and, and, you know, suffering of the mind has been something that it's gone through various stages through the ages from madness, um, all the way till now we call it mental illness. Um, 
and it, this is kind of where psychiatry and philosophy begin to intersect is how do we as a society interpret that? And then as physicians, how do we advocate for our patients best? And some physicians have, have decided that full autonomy and even the autonomy to end one's life is best for advocating. I personally disagree um, with that. And so that I think that's why um, you've brought me on the podcast. Um, but it, I do want to say that reasoned people, I think, can come on both sides of the issue. Yeah, and our podcast, The Common Bridge, is designed more to inform than to influence. Um, I just found it interesting because uh, Canada makes a lot of noise about indigenous peoples and who occupied the land before Canada. Yet, th when this law was first introduced, um, a lot of the very vocal opposition came from the indigenous peoples because they've said, look, we're at the bottom uh, of the levels of society. We do suffer from alcoholism, addiction, poverty, hopelessness, and you're going to make us eligible for further eradication. And they, you know, started drawing the obvious parallels that we, you'd expect. I mean, it was not just, um, you know, Nazi Germany. It's the, 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 predisposition in Iceland to uh, abort, euthanize uh, babies in utero that have Down syndrome. Now, it's not a requirement, but it's certainly encouraged. And so I I kind of trying to work this out that you would talk with Dr. Hong, a person coming in and, oh, you have a problem because you're suicidal. And yet sometimes this is almost being presented as, well, your solution is suicide. This is how, how does a lay person like me sort that out? So that's, that's an issue that we're still trying to get a better idea about. Um, I, I don't, uh, the way that some of my peers in psychiatry are framing suicidality is changing. Um, and I, I have my own personal views on that, but, but, I can I see the reason through it. There is a there is a logos to it, so to speak. Um, I personally fall on the, on the in the realm of suicidality is is a psychopathology, and so because it's a psychopathology, how can we grant capacity to a patient wishing suicide? Um, now, where this gets murky um, in terms of kind of logic is patients that have less than six months to live. So typically hospice patients, mm -hmm. um, even the most hard lined, no to euthanasia physicians, when they encounter someone suffering immensely from cancer or, you know, any innumerable number of, of, of deadly um, conditions who wish to end their life early are, you know, their hearts are usually softened to that request because it, it death is unfortunately a very ugly thing and it can be, it can be very, very painful and difficult for some people to pass. Um, now, well, that, and that's what the Canadian law does differentiate. There's, you know, people whose natural death is considered reasonably foreseeable and, and physicians have been doing this, you know, since the beginning of time, uh, easing people along, you know, with pain medications and at times, enough pain medication to uh, bring about the end of their life. And I think that's seen as compassion. Um, but then there's people who don't have a natural death in the foreseeable future. And I would, I would imagine that would take in, you know, look, a lot of Alzheimer's patients, um, they're healthy physically, yet they're just not there mentally. And it seems to be opening a door uh, to the, uh, you know, medically assisted death uh, for Alzheimer's patients and those with other cognitive deficits. Yeah. And I believe that my peers who are for this would say, uh, I'm, I'm going to speak for them hesitantly, that um, once we kind of open the floodgates for physicians to begin to tease out how do we go about legalized euthanasia, we'll be able to start then developing guidelines of you know, who, who does qualify? What are the nuances of new, of Alzheimer's patients? What are the nuances of patients that um, have cancer, but it's not lethal in the next six months? Those types of things. Um, I caution against that just for the sake of 
there's a lot of gray area in this. And there's a lot of, uh, sci- uh, I won't say science, but medicine in particular is not an exact field. A lot of what we do operates in the gray, especially in psychiatry. Um, and so I do worry about, you know, patients falling victim to a system that has a good intention, but unfortunately um, has a very final outcome. Um, and, you know, it's the finality of the euthanasia that, that alarms me the most. In, indeed. And, you know, I think everybody reaches a point where they can accept uh, their mortality um, and perhaps understand that, yeah, this is going to be, you know, the end of their uh, life on, on this on this earth. And I'll leave the spiritual discussion uh, for a later day. Uh, but the, it's the fear that the first step on medically assisted uh, death, sanctioned by the state, um, supported by the state, uh, leads to uh, almost a you know cultural norm that it's it's just the right thing to do, or worse yet, um, as we've seen in some of the you know most horrible societies, um, it's demanded. You know, the, Cuba, um, again, Nazi Germany, other of the totalitarian states, and I, isn't that a legitimate fear? I believe so. Yeah, I absolutely believe so. Um, I'll, I'll I'll use an example of a patient that sparked my interest in this when I was in medical school. Um, so I've been reading up on this for, for quite a while now, and um, the literature on this is actually quite prolific. Um, but we had a patient who came through, and she was uh, a nice, nice older lady, and she had had a fight with her family. Um, because she had felt that she'd been somewhat depressed for the past year since COVID started. So this was 2020. She had been slightly depressed. Um, and because she couldn't really see anybody anymore, she wished to end her life. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing wrong with her and medically. So I, I, and like I said, I want to include psychiatric. Um, I want to include psychiatric under medical, but for the sake of kind of the conversation, somatically her body she had hypertriglyceridemia which is a very i mean it's you can be serious but hers was a mild case um and she was on lipitor and that was really it so she was really in great health um but she had purchased um the means to travel to switzerland get a hotel so the flight was booked the hotel was booked and the contract had been written up for her to terminate her life in switzerland and she kind of sprung this on her family out of the blue. So the family called the authorities. Um, the psychiatrist at the local ER has the power, if this in this case, to pretty much have the authorities um, haul her in, uh, hopefully not in handcuffs. Usually that's not the case. Um, but So she did agree to come to the psychiatric ER. Um, and there she was convinced that she should go into a three to five day stay on an inpatient adult psychiatric unit. While she was on that unit, she firmly believed that she should continue to, she wanted to continue with um, euthanasia and that it was none of our business what what she does with her life. Now, I I believe she has some great points there. I I really do. I I completely sympathize with her. Um, And unfortunately, this patient was uh, involuntarily committed after that. And so, you know, the nuances of all of, of why we can get into if you want, but she was involuntarily committed. And then during that stay, she changed her, she agreed to change her mind on wanting to commit euthanasia. She was released and she was put into the care of her ex-husband. She moved back to another state. And I caught up with her about eight months after that on a phone call. And she was very happy to still be alive. So that's where I really kind of got this idea that, you know, I'm really against this because the patient, she was autonomous. She did have capacity while she was with us, but she was having a psychopathology. So whether it was the depression, whether there was other things that we weren't picking up, whatever was causing it, it was a psychopathology. And so to acquiesce to a autonomous request so final in absence of a, a, a life ending illness, it, I'm glad, I'm, you know, obviously glad we didn't do it because 
she's still alive and happy to be so. I really appreciate you sharing that story with us because I think it it really highlights the dilemma. Um, and you know, under this current Canadian law, it would have been fine for lethal drugs to be supplied uh, if not administered to this woman, and you know, with no opportunity for uh, her to be healed. And I think we can all see the difference between somebody that is suffering from a mental illness, and that's now coming into parity, we think, in society with uh, medical illnesses. Um, we don't know exactly who's going to be treated. And yet on the medical side, there, there's a lot of evidence now, and physicians can look and say, look, this person that has pancreatic cancer, for example, um, that it's gone beyond the point where we can do anything more and let's let make the person's passing as easy as possible. And, and, and to me, those are two very, very different things. Um, and then, of course, we go back to what you're saying about the, the homeless and the addicted and perhaps the disabled, because um, I know in some of my reading in preparation for this episode today, uh, there are Canadians that say, are, is that, does that mean we're going to take uh, those that can't get care or perhaps haven't been successful in life and they're just going to be eliminating themselves before their time? Right. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I remember reading as a youth in, in 1968, a, a writer named Kurt Vonnegut wrote a lot of short, crisp novels, uh, one called Welcome to the Monkey House. And one of the elements of that was something called ethical suicide parlors that were set next to every Howard Johnson's uh, that was Vonnegut's uh, wit being put into this very serious issue. Um, 1973, um, the famous movie Soylent Green with Charlton Heston. Um, and it was Edward G. Robinson's final role. And in that Edward G. Robinson as an elderly man with hope went to the suicide parlor and, you know, eased himself along. So we've seen these kind of ideas be put forth in the arts. And are we coming to a point in history where we, we can save a lot of lives and extend life? We all know people that whatever happened to them today, had it happened 10 years ago, they wouldn't be with us. Is this some kind of counterbalance that, you know, a way to move the death rate to a, a more historical norm. I, I would hesitate to go that far, um, but it certainly could be used in that manner. If, if, if someone malicious enough were to kind of see the nuance of, of, of what this would allow, I, I think you could devise programs that could lead to that. Absolutely. Because um, I mean, we deal with, suicidal patients on an inpatient psychiatric unit almost every day. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that if you gave these patients the ability, okay, here you go, I'm going to pretty much load the gun for you and hand it to you. And it's not going to be bloody, you know, it's going to be nice and you're going to fall asleep and that's it. Uh, I think a lot would take it. Um, but only in that moment, only in that moment. Um, because we all hit lows, uh, all of us, you know, I, I've definitely hit a low in my life where maybe I would have taken it because it just, it seems so bad. Um, and, and I think kind of the leading neuroscience is kind of showing us why that happens. You know, why do we hit such a low place? And then three weeks later, you didn't, sometimes you'd have never known that we were there. Um, the, you know, the, the neuroscience, that's pretty complex and it kind of gets into um, belief formation and how that um how that occurs in the mind, which we really don't have that great of an understanding of, um, but we're starting to, we're, we're, it's kind of resurging in neuroscience circles is the formation, belief formation, especially in light of all the new kind of buzzwords of misinformation, disinformation. Yeah. We're really interested in how do people believe what they believe? Why do they believe what they believe? And, you know, once you, once you have a belief, why is it so hard to change it? You know, even when presented, like all of us, we believe something until we're presented with just clear, overwhelming evidence, it's really hard to break that belief. Um, so a suicidal patient, they, they really believe that life is worthless and it's, there's really no point to be here. Um, and 
you know, whether that's true or not, it's really a discussion for the philosophers. <laughs> that's, that's not really the discussion of a psychiatrist. I think this, the psychiatrist should always kind of have the view of, yes, life is worth living. Yeah, and I know it's been said um, that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And, you know, people never know what their capacity to work through things uh, might be. And that's where, you know, again, something as difficult to diagnose as a mental uh, illness, because, you know, there is no lab test, there's no MRI, there's no, um, you know, definitive way to say, yeah, this person suffers from uh, anxiety or schizophrenia or any other uh, diagnosis. And there, and then the, the exit pl plan being uh, euthanasia, the, you know, that's, that's a difficult uh, difficult hurdle. And one of the things that, that always concerns me is something that people have termed bureaucratic momentum. And basically bureaucratic momentum, you know, in the United States, we put 535 people, um, you know, in houses of government and tell them they can make laws and pass laws. And guess what they do? Uh, they, they make laws, you know, whether we need them or not. Um, and so when I think about things like this uh, uh, made MAID, the, the uh, law in um, uh, Canada. Okay, well, are there going to be enterprises set up that look, we're here to, you know, administer the, the, the chemicals to end your life here. And eventually someone in the government is going to say, hey, do we really need to invest in those? Well, you know, all bureaucrats, oh, yes, we do, because we had you know, X number of cases last year. Therefore, that proves we need to do that. Therefore, the manager of the next year says, hey, look, if we're going to keep our funding going, we've got to find this many cases. And it sets a, um, a very ill-intentioned cycle into motion. Right, right. And that was never the purpose of, of the program to begin with. Yeah, I completely agree that that is... I would say almost inevitable, but definitely a risk with this program. Absolutely. Um, there's, it's, it's not a, I mean, very few physicians are doing this in Canada to my knowledge, but there's the way that it kind of works is most physicians are very uncomfortable with it, whether they agree with it or not. Um, there's just a few physicians that have, and I'm, I'm I don't want to even attribute maliciousness to them at all. They just, They've had patients, maybe hospice patients or, or patients where it really made sense um, in their minds to do this. And so they've become kind of the go-to physician for euthanasia mm -hmm. um, in that area. Um, and now with hospice, like my heart, really, like a hospice patient, that's a philosophical issue for the society to kind of decide, really. Um, I completely, I think that's completely reasonable either side you're on. Um, but my fear is that a new burgeoning medical, um, specialty would kind of come out of it. Um, not so much palliative care, but euthanasia care. Um, I, and I just don't think that's what we're in the business of. Well, I, I look, I think that most people would agree with that, that again, if we saw uh, a person, you know, with a, a devastating cancer or another illness that, you know, ALS and said, you know, I've had enough. Um, you know, make me comfortable. And if you give me a little extra, boy, that'd be great. I think people can get uh, comfortable with that, but it's enterprises set it up for the specific duty of euthanizing people. Then it gets down to our na the natural next question as well. Who's eligible? Where do we find them? How do we get them here? How do we refer them? And, you know, like your point about most physicians, wouldn't be interested in doing this. It only takes a couple. I mean, we had 30 years ago, a guy named Jack Kevorkian. Um, and I know the way it was reported in the papers about oh, what a good thing he was doing. And, but I had firsthand knowledge of what the police that were coming upon um, his uh, death scenes were showing. And they said this was um, really um, like a horror movie. And then other physicians that told me that during his training, um, what his fascination with death was and some odd uh, deaths during that time. And, you know, they told me this off the record. Um, 
So it doesn't take that many to really make a um, to make a difference. But it also the intriguing what you said about beliefs, and I think you're really onto something there because um, we've been unmoored in a certain respect about what is believable. And just recently, I, I read a poll that 38 percent of Americans. This is a Gallup poll, so this is a you know credible sample and and so forth. 38 percent people said they had no trust at all in newspapers, television, or the radio. None, zero. And only 7% said that they completely trusted the, um, the, the, those sources. So to me, that's, that's another um, element that we've become unmoored from where, do, what, what's the truth? And, and, and I've seen people hang on to beliefs that just have been debunked and proven false. And, and this is across the political spectrum, you know, that they just hang on because they were told that at one time they bought in, they're not letting go. I mean, great case in point, we have people that have views on vaccines, use of masks, lockdowns. You can't move somebody out of one camp and into the other. Very right. rare. Yeah. I, I know with, the anti-vax folks, and I, I even hesitate to say that, um, but I think what happened there is uh, a lot of people, just because of the nature of vaccines being something that goes into your body, um, there's a, and then a law mandating it. I, I, that that made a lot of people uncomfortable, whether valid or not. Um, and so anybody that had a kind of pre-existing um I could say skepticism to a vaccine and then you're forced into it. I think that kind of triggers, uh, you know, our, our kind of ancestral, well, that's a predator, right? And, mm-hmm. and yeah. our brains are wired that once, yeah, once that's a predator, it's a predator. Yeah. And you, I mean, to prove it's a predator, I have to touch it, feel it, taste it. It's not just some guy's going to tell some guy in the news is going to tell me, I like my grandmother needs to tell me that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, it, it these, the way that we're, our brains are wired is for survival. Um, and I think the, ch- the rapid change in the past just five decades um, in terms of our living standards is, is really testing our ability to kind of create truthful belief. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree that it's very it's difficult to choose what to believe. Um, and I know like I'll take my own life um, I, I, as much as, I would want to believe what's absolutely true when you're when you're determining what's true. You really got to fight what your mom and dad told you, <laughs> you know, at least for myself and, you know, whatever view it is, um, or I got to fight what my really trusted friend told me. And so I think when people are coming into interaction with the medical system and the medical saying, system is saying, no, trust us, we do, we, you know, we, we went to medical school for this, we you know, we, we have most of the right answers. When you do make a mistake, it just really solidifies that, that bias of, no, I, I, I can't trust you. And I, I think there's utility to that. Um, but then there's also a downside. Indeed. I think well spoken. Uh, Dr. Tito, this has been a, a great conversation as we kind of move to our close. Um, sure. Is there anything we didn't talk about that we should have um, and, and or any closing comments you'd like to leave with the audience of The Common Bridge? Sure. Um, I just want to highlight uh, in my readings on euthanasia, uh, St. Augustine has really wrote a lot about this. And he was a he was a Catholic um, priest who did a lot of philosophy writing and, and doctrinal writing um, for the Catholic faith. And he wrote about the law of double effect. And so what the law of double effect is, is that I'm not morally culpable for doing something that good now that will lead to something potentially bad later. And it's the word potentially that's kind of the actionable um, word there. And so what St. Augustine argues is that palliative care, which is, you know, giving patients morphine really until they pass away, but in the name of pain alleviation, is morally acceptable under the Catholic faith's law. So, And that's kind of the, you know, Judeo-Christian thought is really kind of the paradigm that America is in. And so... 
it's a good kind of uh, a good way to kind of look at this. And then when you, but if you go to euthanasia, where okay, even though the good end is the alleviation of suffering, that potential modifier is what is now changed because you know that you're killing somebody. Mm-hmm. And so it's not so much that the patient is morally culpable for killing themselves. The physician is morally culpable for causing death um, because they knew it would cause death. Whereas when you're giving morphine, it's, it's not as straightforward as, okay, this is definitely going to kill you. It's, it's more, I'm going to relieve this pain and it's possible that it can. But when you administer some of these drugs, you know, the the euthanasia drugs, that is the intent is to kill. Um, and I, I find that fascinating because it's a very nuanced subject. Um, of, you know, I've kind of said what I believe on it, but I can completely understand the other side who say, yeah, but you kind of know you're going to kill the person when you give the morphine. So, you know, I I love that debate. I think it's, it's a interesting topic and, uh, I would just encourage everybody to, to read some of St. Augustine's work on that. It's, it's quite fascinating. It's, I think it's a great way to end our talk. And, um, I mean, I can, you know, envision myself as that patient in a lot of pain and saying, no, you know, do what you have to do. I know I'm not getting out of this bed. And, you know, if it's, you know, if it's a little extra today versus next week or the uh, next month, you know, yeah, you, you've got a green light from me. Yeah. Um, but just a hundred point- years ago, you know, a lot of people would slit the throat of their own cow for me. I mean, our, our society has, has sanitized, you know, largely for good. So many things that were a common day and so most people have no interaction with death until really it's kind of knocking on their door now. Um, and I think we're just starting to see the the fruits of that kind of reality of modern modern life. So it's fascinating. It is. And we're putting it in the hands of uh, government, of giving them the power over life and death. And um, the responsiveness of our government or lack thereof mm-hmm. is a subject that we cover often. And so finding these policy answers is very important. And that's why we have these discussions. Very good. So we're, we've been with Dr. Nicholas Tito today, a psychiatrist, uh, talking about the law in Canada for uh, medically assisted death and, uh, and all kinds of philosophy around that. So for our listeners, our readers, our viewers, I hope you stayed with us all the way to the end here and didn't react just to the title. And along with our guest, Dr. Tito, this is your host, Rich Helpy, signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Subscribe to The Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.